Well, welcome everyone to the September 2020 meeting of the Mississippi PowerShell User Group. Tonight we have Alec Clues with us, and he'll be presenting Git from the PowerShell prompt. Take it away, Alec. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, hi, yeah, my name's Alec. I'm actually talking to you from uh, Melbourne, where it's uh, 11.30 in the morning and the sun is shining. Um, uh, first thing is, um, I'm obviously an Australian, uh, I learned to speak English in Britain, so um, I'll try uh, not to not to speak in, in too many colloquialisms, but if there's anything I say that's confusing or you don't understand, then please uh, holler straight away because it's quite distracting to sit there and think, what do they say? Um, and then you kind of leave. Um, I've put a link in the uh, chat uh, in the Blue Jeans chat, uh, with a link to this this web page here, uh, Git from PowerShell. Um, so today I'm not going to show any slides. Um, I'm going to talk instead and demonstrate Git as we go along, uh, and hopefully build up your understanding by seeing and doing, rather than just passively listening. Um, that means that there will be less information and more activity. So. I created these notes here to try and back up this. So uh, a lot of, there's a lot of extra detail in these notes. There's lots of links. Uh, and obviously, in an hour, I can only cover the very basics. So you really do need to go to these notes and um, you know go through them and follow the links to read more details. And right down the bottom is perhaps the most important part of the, um, of the notes, which is videos and links to more information. So you should be, you know, looking at these videos, they'll give you a different perspective and they'll give you a more in-depth perspective. Uh, and this guy, is, you probably know, um, is uh, Scott uh, Hanselman and he has done a, and he's quite well known in the Windows community and he's done a bunch of videos about um, PowerShell and, and Git. So um, I recommend looking at those. Uh, and here's the, the big uh, book on Git, which you can read online for free. Okay, um, and the other thing about this is that if you click on this link here to view this project on GitHub, um, you can actually see the demonstration script that I'm going to run through. So if you view the code on here, there's a demo script, and that's what we're going to be using. That's what I'm going to be using to show you Git. Um, so, in fact, if we go over here, um, we'll jump straight in. Okay. So on the right hand side here, um, I've got, uh, let's just move that over and make a bit more room. On the right hand side here, I actually got Visual Studio Code open. So those of you not familiar with Visual Studio Code, um, it's a nice editor, it's got lots of cool features. Uh, it's got built in support for Git uh, here uh, um, and here, but I'm not gonna use those features. I'm only gonna be using Git from the PowerShell prompt. And that's what's at the bottom, obviously, is that right at the bottom is the Git PowerShell prompt. And I'm in a demo, I'm in a, a, a um, a temporary directory called Git demo. And I've only got one directory in there called VS Code. And the only reason that file is already there is because um, I'm going to be, to save myself some typing later on, I've got some code snippets. So that file's just there. But apart from that, I have actually absolutely anything to do it. LS minus force. You can see that apart from that the VS Code directory, it's empty. Okay. Now, if you read all the um, setup guides, uh, it will tell you that you should set up and configure Git. So once you install Git, and there's notes on how to do that, uh, you should then configure Git. So tell it things about your username. Um, if you're on Windows, you want to tell it to uh, do line feed conversions correctly. And a lot of the instructions talk about uh, setting up the user email address as well, which is pretty important because when you publish changes to the public internet or even the private internet, so if it's an in intercompany repository, then the user email is used to um, attribute and track your changes. Uh, it's not used for security, but it is used to sort of identify stuff as belonging to you. So. It's important you set user email, but we're not going to do it yet. Um, we'll do that later on. Um, and all these configuration settings that you set are set in this text file called uh, 
config. So you should go and look at once you set up and use your system, you should go in there and look at it. You can edit settings. Um, so as, as well as using the config command from the from the command line, it's a nice, easy to read file. You can go and edit it, edit it as well by hand. That's, not, that's quite quite a common activity. Um, so what we're going to do is that we are going to sit in this empty directory with nothing in it, and we're going to build a project. So there's nothing in here apart from this this prep the preparation I've done. And the first thing I want to say is, well, what's the status of this repository? I'll talk a bit more about what repositories are and why they're useful later on. Just at the moment, know that a repository is a database where we store our version control history. I'll talk about why that's important later on, because I did promise I would explain the basics of version control. So if we do a git status command, it says, well, I haven't got a git repository here. It's not very useful. So the first thing I want to do is actually create a database uh, in which I can store histories of changes. So if I do git init with no options, it creates a file called .git in here, and some magic happened on the prompt. So I've got a um, I've got a package called posh git installed. Again, instructions in the notes on how to install that. And as soon as posh git recognizes that I'm in something that might be a git repository, it starts portraying additional information. Um, now if you look at some of the videos from Scott uh, Hanselman, he explains this in a bit more detail, so I'm not going to go into too often. But it is just saying, well, there's a change in here that you're not tracking, and there's no other types of changes. So this plus one means that there's an untracked file. Uh, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Uh, but that, that's quite useful. So what's actually happened? Well, if I do an ls again, I can't see any difference. But if I do an ls minus force, I've been lied to. There actually is a new directory called .git. And if I look in there, I can see there's a whole bunch of things, which I don't actually need to worry about at the moment. Um, later on, I can start looking at the config directory and various other bits and pieces. But at the moment, that's just a database. And it's maintained by Git, and we don't have to worry about it. It just sits there, uh, and we can ignore it. So let's start. Now we've, now we've done the preparation. We've actually created a Git environment in which we can do some work. Let's actually start to do some work. So the first thing I'm going to do is that I am going to create a file. So if I just type in the word code, and code is the name of my text editor, and the name of the file, it will actually, and this is Visual Studio Code's magic, code will actually bring up a new editor window in inside this pane. So I'll just get on the top there, I'll get a new file. And there it is. So it's created a new file for me called report1.ps1. And I can actually put some stuff in there. So uh, I've inserted a, a snippet, which is just a call to the get service commandlet, and then the call to the to format it uh, as a table. Okay, so nothing very exciting. Um, I can save that. And if I do an ls, there's my script that I've just created. So the question is now, what does Git know about this script? So if I do git status, it tells me, let's move this up a bit, and in fact, I'll probably do a bit more that way. Can everybody read my screen OK, by the way? Yeah, not hearing anything. We say no. Holler, holler if you can't see it properly. Yeah, no it says, um, OK, thanks. Um, it says um, you're on branch main. So sometime, by default, I have my system configured to create branches, default branches as main. You might see others like trunk or master, depending on the systems configured. It said nothing's been committed as yet, but there are some untracked files. And it even gives you a hint about what you can do with those files. And it lists them in red, which is quite useful. So sure enough. We created a file called report1.ps, and I'd already dumped in some Visual Studio Code uh, files 
be hauling. So that kind of makes sense and it corresponds with what we can see from LS. So what do we do about this? We need to take the change that we've done, which is this new file, and we need to add it into version control so that we can start to record all the changes that are going to happen to it over time. And doing that in Git is a two-stage process. And if you come from other version control tools, this will be a bit strange, but you add the file that you're interested in, which in our case is report one, to the staging area. And I might just nip out from here and show you a picture, which I hope will make this a lot more obvious. Here we go. You can see this picture here. I was busy editing files in my working copy. Uh, this is also called the working tree. And I just did an add. So I added that one file into what's called the index. So that's called staging. Um, index and staging used interchangeably. You'll see both you filled. Because of the way I got it configured, um, it's going to say, well, when you check it out or use it on Windows, it's going to become a carriage return line feed. Uh, so it tries to do the right thing. Um, and if you've got users working on Linux or Macs, uh, exchanging files with people working on Windows, it will attempt, if it's properly configured, to keep the line endings correct. Okay, That's a bit of an involved topic. I'm not going to talk about it too much more today. Um, so if I've added that to the to the index, what does that actually mean? Well, git status is our friend again. So just type in git status. And this time it says, well, there's still no commits, but there's a new there's a new file in the index uh, waiting to be to be committed, and there's still this untracked thing out here. So I'm going to start off my um, my repository history by saying git because so far it's just in staging; it's not actually inside the repository database. By going git commit. And I hit the tab, oh, I shall do that again. Posh git gives me tab completion. So that's another reason for installing posh git. So git commit. Um, and what I'm saying is I now want to take the changes that are in the staging area or in the index and commit them into the repository. So I just go git commit. And the, what it does is that it actually pops up an editor window here, prompting me to enter information. So the traditional message on the first one is initial commit, but um, when I add a bit more detail, commit messages are important. Your your future self will thank you. The more information that you put into a git commit message, added draft report still. So I don't intend to release this version yet. It's still a work in progress. Once I've done that, I'm just going to close that editor window and save the file, which is Control W. And I've hit my first problem. And do you remember that I said before that the email address was important? And I haven't set the email address, so it's actually come back and said, well, I've done the commit, but I don't know what your email address is. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to suggest is that you set it and then you modify the commit to add that extra information in. Now, the reason I didn't set the email address is because often on our workstations we're working on side projects i certainly am um, and we want to um, use our personal email address and then in our work projects we want to use our work email address so you can actually store configuration properties globally which is the minus minus global option to the config or if you omit that it gets stored in the repository and that setting is specific to the repository so what I'm going to do is go git config user or email and I'm going to put in my professional email address because this is a work project. Um, now I haven't used the minus minus global so that setting is actually stored inside the repository. So if I go to a different repository and set a different email address, then those commits will be recorded against that email address. So now I just need to go commit again, but this time go amend the last commit. And I want to reset the author. And again, tab completion is your friend. 
Um, it will open up the editor again to say, well, you might want to add some some another message, but I don't want to, so I can just hit Control W to save that away. And it's now committed. And now, if I go git status, it doesn't say no commits yet. It says you're on branch main. It does complain about the untracked files, but reports 1.ps1 is now under version control. It doesn't need to tell us anything about it. So the first thing about version control systems is that they track changes to files in your project as you're making them, and they allow you to record those changes with and, and record the important information about that about those changes. So what sort of information do they record? Well, git log tells us, I might make this a bit bigger. So I've used the git log command here, and it's told me that Alec Close, and notice the correct email address has been used because that was the, the thing I set up. It tells me when I did it, and at the same time, it's telling me, it's giving me the message I gave. So it's recording what changed, when it changed, who did the change, and reports the commit message, so hopefully why the, why the change occurred. And this is the core of a version control system. This is why version control systems are used, because this is one change. We're going to do some more changes later on. Different people could be involved in the project. The, the project will grow, um, will produce different versions, uh, and so that all this complexity gets recorded for us. We don't have to do the accounting to recognize what happened where and how. Is that all making sense so far? Okay, good. Now, you notice if I do a git status, I get this annoying message about this directory being untracked, which it is, but I don't want to put it under version control. It's usually, in my opinion, a bad thing to put your IDE and other sort of developer cruft, which isn't central to the project under version control. You might want to put it in a different version control repository, but not into the project one because that might conflict with settings that other people have on their system. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm actually going to document to Git that this directory, this whole directory, what's in it, is to be untracked. So the way to do that is just to create a magic file called .git ignore and have it list what you don't want to track. So if I do a git status now, VS Code has disappeared, so VS Code is an ignored file, but git ignore, a new file, has appeared. So I'm just going to go git add, and this is this is something that confused me when I first started, and I think other people, but the fact that you do commit your git ignore file, so the files that get ignored are transmitted around the repository and, and everybody sees it. So git ignore uh, is the file that I'm adding, and then git commit, and I'm going to do a shortcut here, so if I'm going to wait for the editor to come up, I'm going to go minus M, very simple message added, git ignore. And now if I do a git log, I've actually got two commits. Um, so I've got the the one that was initial commit and date and time, and then a different date and time, a different message. And it's pointing me here that I'm on the main branch and head, which is the current commit that I'm working on top of, is pointing onto the main branch. We'll see your head talked about later on. Okay, I might actually move this um, out of the way over to this other monitor so that I can still see it, but I can actually then make this full size. Okay, so our report is not very useful. Um, I did forget to do one thing, and that was test it uh, before I committed it, but it does just print out some, some service statuses. But I'd like to make this a bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my file up here, and I'm going to add a comment block. So not a brilliant comment block, uh, but... Um, I will work on this and make it a bit better. It has inserted uh, the date and my name and other bits and pieces for me. So let's save that. And again, if we do the git status command, 
we've got this, it's now been modified. Now this is again another difference between uh, get another version of Troll Tools Lab Subversion is that every, it's not a question of adding a file uh, and then it's under version control and you just commit it. Every time you make a change to any file, or whether it's adding adding new content to a file, or whether you want to remove a file completely, or maybe rename a file with git move, git, uh, you need to then um, you need to stage that that change. So the report that one has been um, staged. I can actually see what's changed because I can do a git diff uh, just just uh, to show you that it will give me reports on the differences between my development version and what was last committed. Um, but now that we have a change that we're happy with, um, the first thing we can do is test it. And it does work, except there was an mess error message at the top here that I was not, I, I, that um, it needs to be paid attention to. So this emphasizes the fact that it's important you test your code before you commit it. If I run it again, that's a lot better. So I'm ready to, to do this. So again, it's git add. Uh, and let me just look at, well, first of all, I'm going to do git status. So the only thing that's modified here is report one. So I actually use a shortcut go git add dot, and it will add everything that's changed in this directory without me having to specify the specific file name. And again, if you go git status, it says, well, I've got this change that's waiting to be committed. So I go git commit. Uh, again, I'm going to use a shortcut minus m added comment just to save time. Away we go. And if I do git log, if I do git log, then I get the third commit. So I've got three commits now all happening on one branch, which is the main branch. I'm just going to quickly now um, add another file that I don't really want. Um, so so I've created now this file that I, I'm, I'm going to accidentally commit. So I'm going to commit, add, and then git commit. bad file and it's committed into into the into the system um, I can take it away so I can go commit remove what do I call this file bad and now if I do git status it says well we're waiting to delete this file if you do another commit that file will be removed from the next version of the repository. So if I do git commit minus m um, remove that file. Now and it's removed from both my working uh, directory and, and the repository. Now it's important to realize that what's happened now is that the the file has been removed from the current commit and all future commits but previous commits if I check out so if I do git check out and there's a shortcut I'm going to say the current commit with a tilde after it sorry with a with a hat after it and if I do an ls now my file my bad files come back so it exists in the repository history. And this is kind of another major point of, of version control systems is that allow you to move back in time and get hold of the state of a previous version of your project. And that's pretty key. So it's about providing information what's happened in the past. And it's about allowing you to travel back in time or to a different fork of development to find stuff that isn't currently in your working environment. I'm actually going to move back my commit by going check out main. So I'm actually moving back 
onto here. And if I do an S again, that file's disappeared. So my working directories, every time I do a commit or, or, or do a checkout, my working directory is moving to, to other commits in the version control repository. And that's what the checkout does. Um, in this case, the last checkout, I said, I want you to check out to the latest version on the main branch. You can show uh, what a previous commit does. So I can actually look at what's the difference between my current commit or my current working directory and the commit two, two commits ago. So if I go commit show, and I can use head, which you remember is the current current commit that we're on. I can go up hat, up hat, which gives me two versions back. It's actually going to show me those two commits I did. So it shows me the fact that I did the block in, uh, and it should show me that I did a bad. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, so it's it's skipping the fact that the two commits ago there was no bad file. So it's just showing me that the difference between the current commit and two commits ago was this comment block. If I just went once, it would show me that there was this bad file. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Did I? Yep. Okay. Now, This, um, if I run this report, it's reporting on all the different paper cut services that are running on my system. I work for a company called Papercut. This is our system. Um, the reason I'm showing you paper cut type things is because I don't do Windows system administration, otherwise, I'd be running system administration reports. But I had some scripts lying around that actually report on paper cut services. But there's also this service up here, which is developed by, by Epson, not by us, that integrates into Papercut. And so I'd like to create a special version of this report that uh, works on Epson sites and shows additional information about Epson. Um, so the, but, but not everybody's running Epson software. So I actually have to create, I want to create a separate branch for that and create that development effort separate from the main branch. So the way you do that is get check out and go I want to create a new branch and I want to call it Epson okay now a lot of documentation um, they use the git branch command to create uh, new branches I, I think this is actually easier to understand is I'm checking out a new branch and it's going to be based on the current head which is which is the main branch so I switched to a new branch my prompts changed I do the git status thing I'm on branch Epson, nothing to commit, everything's clean. Uh, if I do git log, it shows that the current state of the repository, which is head, sorry, the current state of my working directory, which is head, is pointing to a branch called Epson as well as a branch called main. So there's no difference at the moment between the main and Epson branches. But let's change that. So again, I'm in this, I'm in my report directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some extra Epson reporting stuff in here. Um, it's very simple. It's not very. It's not. Uh, it's not particularly clever. All it's doing is counting the number of times that the word error um, occurs in the Epson log. Um, probably a bit unfair on them because there's all sorts of different reasons. But for illustration, it will work fine. So I save that away. And um, I'm going to test it. And it produces this extra extra line in here. So the report's basically working. Um, and I can go git uh, commit. Well, let's just say what the git status is. I've got a, a shortcut alias to st for status. Uh, you can look up how to create your own aliases. And I've just got this one modification. So I'm going to go git, whoops, git, hello, computer, okay, git commit and A adds in any already modified files. If I had new files, the A wouldn't work, but this saves me having to do the git add. 
So commit minus A, and then give it a message minus M. Added support for Epson. And that's committed. So if I do a git log now, um, I've got the branch main is, is in the past, and I'm not, head is pointing to a branch called Epson. The last commit on that branch was adding support for Epson. That's not a particularly uh, functional bit of uh, software. I'm not actually checking, because I'm just assuming that the, the Epson log is there. So what I'm going to do is to um, add in an extra check. So I'm going to do X4 and this actually uh, does a get service uh, to make sure that the service exists before it then tries to pass the log. Um, so I can put that all code out, save that away, um, make sure it works, which it does. Um, and I can actually do a git diff and see the differences, which is this uh, things that have been deleted, things that have been added in. Um, so that, that report's quite powerful, but I'm not going to go through it in any detail now. That'll be something for you to work offline. Um, I tested it. I can now commit it again. So now I've whoops I've got something on the Epson branch. I've got another thing on the Epson branch, um, and then I've got something on main. So what I'm going to do now is all the Epson. So if I just quickly check the status of my working working repository, everything's clean. So I can actually jump now back to the main repo. So I can go git checkout main. And I switch back to branch main and suddenly I'm back to the old main reports, the simple reports that only that only print doesn't print out the absent information. But really I'd like I'd like uh, I'd like my main report to be a bit better. So I'm gonna add in some better changes in here. Um, So this is a quite a different report. Uh, and in order to make that happen, I need to actually uh, do some setup. So I'm going to create a setup script, another new script in here. And if I've got everything set up correctly, it's going to do, it's going to just build a library for me. Uh, so first of all, let's test this. Take a couple of minutes to run. Whilst we're waiting for this to run, has anybody got any questions? Does not appear so. I'm oh, saying like we got yeah. one in the chat. Hmm. Uh, from Charles Palmer says at work we use yep. a subver subversion based yep. tracking system. You got that? Got the. And I am starting to use Git locally. I'm creating a working copy with SVN, and then I'm doing a Git in it inside that folder. Should I track yep. the dot Git folder with my SVN, or should I exclude or ignore my Git folder? You should probably exclude or ignore your Git folder because SVN is tracking the changes to your files. See. So. You're doing double bubble. There is, um, it's a number of years since I had this. I haven't, I haven't used Subversion for about six years. Um, there was a set of tools called Git-SVN, which allow Git and SVN to interoperate. So I suggest looking for those. Um, 
Okay, so I I ran that setup, uh, and now if I re run report one dot ps one, nothing happened. Oh, because I didn't save the file. There's there you go. That'll that'll do you every time. And of course, it's a demo, so nothing works right. Invalid authentication token supplied. Okay, I know what the problem for that is. I was doing some other development over the last 24 hours and I've messed up my auth token. I can fix that very quickly. Um, so. Oops. I need to configure the security token so that um, this this um, system can talk to Papercut. I heard late earlier on that there was some schools here. Anybody, any of you guys using Papercut? Well, the college I was working at until earlier this year we were we we're using paper cut there oh cool okay so that hopefully should fix that problem yes so this is a bit fancy so it's using it so this stuff is all the same as it was before i'm just using the get service applet to get some information about services, but then I'm using an API inside our product to get information about the product, so what version we're running and so on and so forth. Um, of itself, it's not interesting, but what is interesting is that I've had to add a lot more to this script now. So as it's becoming a bit more production-like, I'm generating uh, an HTML report, um, and I've just for testing done an invoking expression, but you can imagine you actually deploy this to some sort of portal. So this is hopefully looking a bit more production-like. Um, if I do a git status on what the current deal is, um, I've got this directory here, which I built the DLL I needed. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. But I've got this setup uh, and this report one HTML uh, and this report HTML file. I don't really want to to get either. But I have got this setup script. I, I am interested in. And of course, I modified this report. So the first thing I could do usefully is I could, and it, I'm kind of going through this just to show that this is perfectly normal workflow. Uh, you'll do this throughout um, throughout your your projects. So I want to ignore the server proxy server command proxy directory. Proxy, I hope I spelled it right. I want to explore. I want to ignore the report one HTML file. Save those away. So now, if I do a git status, I've report. I've modified the git ignore file. I've just, but I've just got to worry about this setup. So I can go git add setup. I'm starting to go a bit faster now, uh, and you can see that the status of things is changing in my prompt to reflect the different. Different things are going on. I can either git add, um, or sorry, git commit, and I'm just going to do minus add because it'll pick up that way. It'll pick up these two modified files, but I'm not going to use git. I'm not going to use the minus n option because I want a more complete option. More prod like uh, report. Add DLL script. Add calls to APIs via DLL and rest. Um, create HTML. And I probably had a bit more if it, but I, you know, this is just a demo. So, so hit Control W to save that, save it, 
and away it goes. So we've done two different and distinct pieces of work now. Um, we have a small change for Epson, and we have quite a big change to make the report nicer, but they're actually on two different things. And we can see that if I go git k, which is a program that comes with git, and then minus minus all, git follows Unix uh, and Linux uh, POSIX type uh, command interfaces, not PowerShell. Now there is a there is a there is a module called Git uh, which you can install through the NuGet package repo, repo. I don't recommend it because it attempts to turn um, Git into a sort of a more PowerShell type in, type command commandlet. But the problem with that is then that all the documentation doesn't really make sense. So I would suggest you you stick with the sort of the POSIX style environment instead. And um, that's easy for me to say because I'm used to it. Um, so this has actually shown that we've got two branches and they're separate. So does everybody kind of make sense of that? So we've got two. You know, this is this is probably the, th the third and final important feature that version control tools add. Uh, and Git does this particularly well because it, 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 in Git we talk about branches being cheap. Uh, so Git is able to branch very easily, uh, more easily than you can with Subversion, for instance. Uh, and later on, uh, if we get time, we should be doing a merge. We'll bring it all back together again. But the yellow button is showing our current checkout, and the Epson branch is showing what we previously checked in on the Epson branch. Yeah. Uh, let me move this out of the way and go back to my script. Right now, I would like the Epson version to also be a bit fancy. So what I can do is I can get, sorry, shouldn't have done that. I was in the wrong window. Lost my place. Michael Main, right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge this new fancy report into Epson, so Epson has the same functionality. So I do a git uh, git checkout. Oh, actually, so before I so now I'm hopefully what I've done now is I've explained the basics of why version control systems are useful. And so the basic concepts around having a version control database, being able to look at the status and get historical information and be able to do checkouts and branching. And that stuff's not specific to Git. So um, hopefully that all made sense. Uh, if you didn't, then please put some notes in the chat. Um, and now we'll just be sort of focusing on the Git workflow. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about version control tools in general, but specifically talk about Git. Okay. So I could just check out Epson. So it's as simple as that. Switch to branch Epson. Notice that the this this setup XE doesn't exist anymore in this branch. So that says that's deleted, and this has gone back to this thing. So how do I bring these changes in? Well, it's actually quite easy. I just do git merge main. So I'm saying to git, you're currently on the Epson branch. I want you to bring all the things you know about on the main branch into this Epson branch, so that I can. I can end up with a single set of changes with everything in it. They said, well, yeah, I tried to do that, but the problem is there's a conflict. So uh, this is kind of where Git becomes a bit less intuitive and you have to start um, just learning it and understanding it and practicing. But what it said is, well, I've tried to merge them, but there's been some clashes. So it's basically put the Epson changes at the top and uh, it's put the the other the main changes at the bottom. So what I actually want to do is I want to have both changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take whoops, I'm just going to take all of this. I'm going to cut and paste it and put it at the bottom. Not quite as simple as that, but um, we'll get there. Um, in fact, what I should probably do is take this one stage further. Take 
take that out and put it inside this right loop. So if there's an Epson service, then it will it will output this information. And I think that will work. Let me go up here. Um, I don't need these markers. Um, so I did that a, a bit quickly. Uh, so apologies for that, but um, I basically I've taken two sets of changes and I've merged them together, and I've had to do some manual massaging to kind of put it correctly. And that's that's you know something you you do all day every day with this this type of setup. Save that away, and if the merge gods are smiling, that actually worked. Um, except it didn't do the Epson stuff. So I wouldn't expect to see Epson in there, so I'm not quite sure why that went wrong. Um, I'm conscious that time is, is kind of um, progressing, so I'm not quite sure why that didn't happen. Oh, because I, yeah. That will be an exercise to do later. I also forgot to do something, but I, I really want to press on and not, not miss any of the great features. So just, just accept it should work. Uh, hopefully you'll be happy with that assumption. Now, what's kind of important is to go back to here and see what happened to our tree map. So you can look at this as a map of trees. So if I go file update, um, ah, yeah, okay, so, I've made the changes and I've saved the file, but if you look at the git status, it says, well, what do you want to do with this change? So to actually resolve it, I actually now have to add in this report. And it does give you instructions. Um, it now says you can run git commit now just to fix those conflicts so i did the report do the git commit it tells you what it did so it gives you a suggested message maybe i'll put a thing in here staying still needs work save that away And it's now done a merge. And if I go back into here and hit refresh again, which is uh, come from my keys, yeah, update F5, it's now brought the main branch on top of the Epson. So the Epson branch now contains the changes in in from here as well as from here. So that's branch merging. Ah, thanks, Charles. Oh, yes, that did work. Yep, so it wasn't me. Well, it was finger trouble, not a fundamental uh, error with my thing. So it actually, you know, merged both sets of reporting features together. Thank you. Any questions about that so far? No? Okay, right. Uh, there's a couple of extra things that I had hoped to show. Oh, I might, I might have time to that. So I can actually now, I could now rebase back onto main. So if you notice, if you go back into here, you notice that Epson contains everything on main, but main doesn't contain everything on Epson. So what I might want to do is to take the changes in Epson and merge it back into main. So I can actually do that um, a couple of different ways, but I'm going to do it with a merge rather than a rebase. So I'm going to do kit check. Well, let's just check my status, make sure I don't have stuff lying around. It's all clean. It's all good. Git checkout main. And now I can do git merge Epson. Now that actually went straight through because 
the changes between when I when I merged the changes from main into Epson, there was a conflict, and uh, the system was not able to identify what went where, and I had to manually modify it all. But going back the other way, it was much easier for the system, and it was able to automatically make the changes. So it's actually done what's called a fast forward. Uh, and the reason it did that, and, and so the result of that is that it just moved main onto Epson because Epson already contained main. So therefore, main could be fast forwarded to just sit at the same point that Epson is. Um, so the point of all that was was not to get you to understand the uh, fast forwards immediately, but to know that fast forwards exist and it's something you'll see discussed in your team if you start using Git, whether we should fast forward or um, also you'll see references to rebase, which is a bit advanced for this for this demo, um, or whether you should do a merge. And, and different teams will do things in different ways and have different policies. Right. And now that I'm happy that I kind of have things ready for production, I can tag it. So if I go git tag, and I'm going to call this beta one. And that, if I again go to here, because it's quite a convenient way of displaying it, if I hit go one, I've actually now hit, um, I've attached a, a label to this commit. Now, the thing that's different between labels and branch, or tag, I beg your pardon, not labels, tags, the difference is different between tags and branches is that tags don't move. So if I make a change on the main branch, then, then there'll be another commit and main will move up and will keep moving on. But beta will stay where it is. I can always go back to beta and if somebody says, I want the beta version of the software, you can just go, well, go, you know, git checkout beta one and you can give it to them. And, you can, and so it's a way of having fixed points or fixed labels in your repository um, for releases and other important events that you might want to go back to in, in the future. Uh, sorry, in the, yeah, in the future as, as the basis of, of further work. Okay. Last, last thing I want to do is I want to use GitHub. So I want to actually publish the work I've done. A um, bit of limited time for this, but very quickly, GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and some others are software as a service. So they allow you to um, to publish um, either publicly or privately um, your source code repository so that other people can get changes and so on and so forth. So for instance, here is the source code repository for this presentation file. Uh, don't worry about the details and the demo script that I've been going through as well. Um, but this is the PowerShell user group. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to um, use PowerShell from the PowerShell prompt. So here I am in PowerShell and there's a utility called um, GitHub command line. There are links in the notes or there will be when I update the notes. And so if I type GitHub GH and go minus help, there's, there's things I can do. Very quickly, I can create a public repository on GitHub from this repository from this repository on my workstation. So I go GitHub repo create and make it public. Give it some names, give it a description. Yes. And that has actually created on my personal GitHub account. So let's go to my personal GitHub account. It's created an empty repository with nothing in it. So I actually now have to push the contents of my local repository to my um, to my um, Miro GitHub repository, and there's again some magic to do that, which is just push, and that takes change. This takes all the changes on my local system, not the latest ones, all my changes, and pushes them up into Origin. And Origin is 
this remote URL effectively, well not effectively, this is a remote URI to the GitHub repository. Now I already authenticated, it uses OAuth, so I'm already authenticated the system. I've created a public repo so any, anybody can come in here and get this information, can get this and use it. Uh, I'm missing a readme, which is good practice. And once it's up on here, I've got access to features. Like not only do I have a repository and somebody else can come along here, they can clone the repository down to their local system, but they can raise issues, pull requests. So that's a way that Git people exchange uh, commits between each other and, and get commits reviewed. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that GitHub provides I'm not going to, but this is the important stuff. Other people can get to your code. They can, this is how they can clone a repository onto their local environment so that they can start to work on it. And then you can exchange changes between yourselves. Uh, and you can also, you've got other features as well. And that's it. I'm about good for time. So the VS Code gets stuff. Uh, so I don't really use it, to be honest, Charles. Okay, so before before I dive on to that, any questions? Okay, VS Code. So if I make a change to a file, um, so here's a silly change, just adding a comment into a file. Do a git status. This is changed, but I've now clicked on this um, on this uh, helper that comes with VS Code, and it's identified this change. It allows me to see the difference between the change. Um, I can stage the changes by hitting the plus button. I can give it a message. So I can give it the commit message, demo change. And I can make that message longer. So again, you know, generally people often do one line title only comment to commit messages, but good practice means that really you should summarize the change for your future self and your on your partners. Stage changes. So if I go plus to stage the change, that's now going in there. Um, and if I go commit, so I'm hitting the up arrow here to go commit. So there are no change. So now, if I go back to Git status, everything's everything is added and committed, and I can now. Oh, uh, okay. I can now push the changes to my repository. So that commit that's a demo change I just did from Visual Studio Code. Okay, Christopher is asking, is there a best practice for branches? There are many best practices for branches. Um, new one each time. So probably the most the most popular branching approach is something called Git Flow. Uh, so you can just look that up. Um, a lot of people, and, and it would be best practice to close it once it's merged so it doesn't hang around. So that, that's for sure. Um, people have different conventions. So for instance, at our place, uh, we have, we preface all of our branches into a namespace. So if it's a feature branch, it's feature slash then branch name. And we embed the JIRA ticket reference into the, into the branch name. If it's a hotfix, then it's hotfix slash whatever, and so on and so forth. Um, so people you know, have all, all these conventions around branches. Um, more branches. If you're a solo worker, then you know I, I work a lot on my own because of the nature of my job. Uh, so I, I have a few branches. So generally, a repository that I work on will have two or three reposit will have two or three branches for specific features that I might be doing. Um, and I don't want to sort of pollute the main branch, um, but um, 
on our on our production code base, which is quite big, then there are hundreds of branches for each feature and each uh, bug fix and so on, because it allows the developers. And also, we are working on a on a single repo, so Git supports multiple workflows. In in our case, for our for our main uh, product thing, it's quite a large code base. It used to be in Subversion. Um, then we have a single repo, and every everybody commits into that repository, um, which is not what you see on GitHub. Uh, and that means that branches are important. On GitHub, it tends to be, or, or with the GitHub workflows, may not be so important because you may have forked repositories, which I haven't talked about. Um, but that case, the fact that you fork the repository tends to mean you need less branches. Squashing, so that's when, so that's a good question. Um, the purists say that, that for instance, here I, I, I did a branch for Epson and I did two changes. I did add support for Epson, add check for Epson. Um, uh, and the purists will say, well, this is poor practice because the Epson change was a single change. So it should be a, a single commit. So what I should have done was before I actually published this change, and merged it in, I should have squashed these two commits, which you can do, uh, and make it a single thing saying, I added the Epson service, and I did this, and I did this, and this, and it's a clean history. Um, so that's that's the purest approach. Um, it may well be valuable in your specific environment, depending on how people work. Uh, people might be moving a lot, doing a lot of work in progress commits, they might not be. Um, so you need to make a policy choice. You can always change it. Um, but getting people, you know, policing people to squash their commits every single time uh, can be a lot of effort. And you look at what's the downside of having too many commits on a branch. Um, it may not be that severe to want you having to police it and reject changes that haven't done squashes and things like this. It's a matter of taste and opinion, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Any other questions? Anybody totally confused and, and wishes they hadn't come? Well, the good thing about recording it is, is if anybody's confused, you can rewatch it again later. Yes, and, and because it's quite a big product with quite a lot of features and you can use it in a myriad different ways, uh, which is hopefully it's what came up what I said. It, it can be confusing, and there's only so much I can cover. So I've deliberately been quite. I've glossed over lots of details. I've, as I said in um, previously, I've skated over the top, uh, and that's why I provided those links and references in the notes. So I strongly encourage you to go and look at some of those videos, read some of the blog posts, click on the links for for documentation and other stuff. Um, you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get it all from just me waffling on for an hour. Uh, okay, I'm done. Well, thank you for that, Alec. There was a, a lot of good information there tonight.